Hello everyone, I'm Kev P, and I for one am furious at the fandom and success surrounding My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. As a fan of the original TV series, and yes, I mean the original show, not this one. Or this one. Or this one. Or the... What? What the f- I'm talking about the very first animated My Little Pony series to grace our screens. I want to set the record straight that French of His Magic took everything that was charming and lovable out of the series and ruined it for all us hardcore, real My Little Pony fans. Yes, that's right. Ruined. My childhood has been retroactively destroyed and I will never forgive Lauren Faust for this betrayal. I understand that a lot of you watching this will say you were too young to have appreciated the original series, which aired before most of you were born, but that's no excuse because so was I. That's how hardcore I am. At this point, all you fake fans, or brorses as I understand you are called, are probably up in arms about this completely uncontroversial thing that I'm saying. Well, I would never make such a claim without the hard facts to back it up. So sit yourself down and let yourself be schooled by someone much wiser than you as I detail to you exactly why you're wrong. So, where do we begin? Well, let me break it down to you thus. I want to start by giving all you young'uns out there the history of the series, culminating in how I discovered the show myself. Then we'll get into the meat of the issue, my apologies to vegetarians, and explore what exactly it was that made the original show great. Grab onto your butts. We're in for a bumpy ride. For the acutely unaware, My Little Pony started out as a series of pony toys marketed by Hasbro primarily towards young girls. The first toys were produced in 1981 under the name My Pretty Pony, years before the animated specials that led to the film that kickstarted the series. As you can see, they and the first few incarnations of the My Little Pony line weren't all that special. But, although I can't really speak for 80s kids' proclivities for them, they were definitely a thing that at least 90s kids like me enjoyed to collect, despite their relative mediocrity. There was this sort of very unhorse-like, chunky, lazy-looking aesthetic to them which was really appealing and different to most other equine toys on the market at the time. Some were pretty much standalone figures which didn't even have working limbs. Some flicked their tails when you squeezed their sides. Some had plastic wings. Others had soft fuzz all over their bodies. And others still had gems where their eyes were supposed to be. But what each of them had in common was their signature cutie mark, or butt stamp, different for each pony. Who knows how the butt stamp got there in the first place? Were they branded? Were they elaborate, colourful, tribalist tattoos? It's probably best not to think about it. Whatever the case, when the My Little Pony toy line began, so did an era of collecting them all. Just a quick aside here, because I want to tell you what I learned about the Twinkle Eye Ponies when researching this video. According to the My Little Pony comics running alongside the toy line with variable canonicity, they used to be regular ponies who were enslaved by someone called the Jewel Wizard to dig for jewels in the creatively named Cave of Jewels. Due to the darkness of the cave, the ponies went blind over time. That's how it works, right? When the wizard was eventually deposed, and from the looks of it we can only assume outright murdered by Applejack, his jewel-encrusted throne shattered, and the gems stuck in the ponies' eyes, miraculously allowing them to see again. So basically, if you ever see footage of Twinkle Eye Ponies for the rest of this video, I want you to imagine the traumas they must have endured before the events that you see. Anyway, back to the point! In the mid-80s, as part of Hasbro's media strategy, they started to adapt all their toy lines, such as G.I. Joe and Transformers, into animated series. The first My Little Pony animated special aired in the US on April 14th, 1984. And that's where the real fun begins. There were two 22-minute specials in total. Rescue at Midnight Castle and Escape from Katrina, released a year apart and featuring a number of the butt stamp ponies you could collect at the time, but not necessarily adhering to any particular art style. These were followed by the My Little Pony movie in 1986, which is actually a pretty decent film. And as it turns out, it was my gateway drug to the animated ponies when I was about 10 years old, after my sibling got it on VHS tape for their birthday. Yes, VHS. This was the late 90s children. Finally, in 1986, shortly after the film was released, along came the syndicated TV series. Given that the entire purpose of the series was very blatantly to sell toys, the series was originally called My Little Pony and Friends, and it was made up of one 10-minute segment of a My Little Pony episode, followed by another segment starring the products of another unrelated Hasbro toy line, 
such as the Potato Head Kids, the Moon Dreamers, and the Glow Friends. Don't look at me, I've never heard of them either. There were 65 episodes in total, released as two seasons over one year between September 1986 to September 1987. I'm not going to explore the non-pony-related segments in this video because, honestly, who cares? Now, as I mentioned, I never watched any TV syndication of the show as it came out because I was quite frankly not alive for most of it. I watched the movie so many times as I loved the world and aesthetic but didn't realise there was also a series. When I went to the video rental store one day, yes, still the 90s, and noticed that there were tapes of the TV show as well, I devoured them. I remember even at the time feeling like it wasn't quite the same, but ignoring that in favour of enjoying my return to Ponyland. It was only when I travelled to the United States in 2009 and purchased some DVDs of my beloved franchise on a whim that I fully appreciated that the TV show is a textbook case of how not to make an animated series and fell in love with it again for entirely different reasons. So, now that you know the background of the franchise and my connection to the first My Little Pony TV series, I'm going to tell you first why it's good and then tell you why it's really good. The pony segments of the TV series focus on the adventures of the little ponies in Dream Castle and later Paradise Estate, both of which were purchasable playsets, by the way. Also, in order to spread out the product placement, the three main branches of ponies available for sale, Earth ponies, Pegasus ponies, and Unicorn ponies, all live together in the same place, in turn introducing a weird kind of biological determinism into the series. I guess hide-and-seek just isn't a game for Earth Ponies. Gusty's right. I'm not good enough. Earth Ponies are pretty rubbish, honestly. They're just your run-of-the-mill ponies whom, outside of their individual butt stamp, are really only distinguishable or special through their personality. Sundance can jump high but is clumsy. Shady is pessimistic. Applejack likes apples. I honestly don't know why the other, obviously more superior ponies keep them around. Pegasus ponies, as you would imagine, have the innate ability to fly. This doesn't stop them from essentially being dead weight throughout the series during rescues whenever the script doesn't explicitly mention how they're involved in any event. A notable Pegasus pony is Wind Whistler. He uses a lot of big words and seems particularly intelligent. I fail to understand this display of sentiment but is strikingly silent whenever the writers forget who she is. Unicorn ponies can wink or teleport short distances, so long as they ostensibly have an exit. For example, during one episode, the unicorn ponies are trapped in a net and are unable to wink themselves outside of their ropey prison. If only one of us could just escape and get some help! On the other hand, they are still able to use their other unicorn powers, which seem to vary depending on the character. Buttons can apparently use telekinesis, while Fizzy can... make bubbles? You'd think that would be a pretty limited skill, but Fizzy's ability is probably one of the most called upon in the series. The sea ponies are more minor characters, and only occasionally appear in the show primarily as Deus Ex Machina, coming out of seemingly any body of water to rescue the other ponies from various water-related conundrums while singing the same repetitive song. They also have weird bodies. If you're not confused enough by the genetic classifications of the ponies, they're also separated into adult and baby versions of themselves, both versions of which were conveniently for sale at the time as different product lines. Although it's implied in the series that the baby ponies are the actual offspring of their adult namesake, Baby Heartthrob is the unfortunately named child of Heartthrob, for example, who knows how these babies were produced? Male ponies are conspicuously absent for most of the series outside of a cameo from the so-called Big Brother ponies, incidentally also a purchasable product line. There is also one explicitly non-related male pony who appears in one episode, but he's from out of town, and it seems to be implied through the characterization of him and his community that he might even be a completely different species of pony? Moving on from the miracle of birth. Depending on the whims of the scriptwriters that day, Baby ponies occasionally have affected childlike speech patterns. Wanna eat you, hungry? But other times simply speak fluent English in a higher pitched voice to that of adult ponies. Gee, if only I hadn't run away, none of this would have happened to me. As the series goes on, there are cameos from other new pony product lines that were released at the time, including the Flutter ponies, Newborn Twins ponies, Princess ponies, 
the aforementioned Big Brother ponies, and the oddly disturbing First Tooth Baby ponies. But apart from the Flutter ponies, they never seem to enter the canonical character range of the series. Besides the little ponies themselves, a recurring character is Megan, a teenage girl from our world who keeps an actual, non-talking, non-magic, normal horse at home in a stable, and yet is still somehow regularly trusted by the ponies to be invested in their liberation. She lives on the other side of the rainbow that connects Ponyland and our world, and in the first special is bestowed with the Rainbow of Light, a magical sentient weapon that flies around and kicks butt when released from its prison in a heart-shaped locket. Okay, Rainbow of Light, back where you belong! Megan and the secret weapon are called upon many times to save the day, to the extent that one kind of wonders why the Rainbow was trusted to someone who lives in another dimension and not, say, the ponies themselves. Perhaps because they don't have the opposable thumbs required to free it from its slimber? Megan's younger siblings Molly and Danny appear unprompted in Ponyland every so often as well. Like magic. There are also a bunch of creatures called Bushwoolies who are rescued from enslavement in the second special, escape from Katrina, and live around Ponyland from then on. They function as the centrists of Ponyland, agreeing with whatever anyone around them happens to be saying at the time. I guess I'm a failure. A failure. Yeah, you failed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As for the stories themselves, the original series of My Little Pony is notable in that, unlike other TV franchises targeting young girls at the time, plots largely revolve around adventure and questing. Yes, there is your token amount of cutesiness and hyper-femme recreational pursuits such as dressing up and having tea parties, but on top of this, the stories often involve ponies putting themselves in great physical peril for the sake of their friends and their home. They also frequently end up befriending their captors and tormentors in what I can only call pathological Klopholm syndrome. Furthermore, the tone of the series is surprisingly darker than what you might expect. The very first episode of the very first animated show, Rescue at Midnight Castle, opens with a happy cutesy scene introducing the ponies, followed immediately by a terrifying abduction. In another episode, Bright Lights, a young Justin Bieber-like singer called Nightshade lures some baby pony fans backstage, whereupon his zebra manager drains them of their shadows to feed his shadow-eating boss. And at some point in the episode, this happens! Yet another episode has a witch abducting some ponies and forcing them to make a magical cloak out of their own hair? Indeed, the motivation for most of the villain's actions against the ponies is a desire to enslave them in some way. The original My Little Pony series is not a cakewalk, and this surprising contrast in tones kind of makes it fun. Another notable point about the series is that besides some of the villains and side characters like Spike the Baby Dragon and the Moo Chick, pretty much all of the characters are female. So not only does the show immediately pass the Bechdel test, but you end up with a TV series about women with a variety of personalities and skills braving all kinds of danger to protect themselves and others. Also, I will concede that the voice acting is very... variable. What do you mean? Quiet, Gusty. We'll touch on this later on. But it does provide a relatively early role to Nancy Cartwright, aka Bart Simpson. You can hear variations of her Bart voice coming from a bunch of different ponies' mouths throughout the series. Knock off the surprise a surprise, we have to get to Flutter Valley! The voice of Spike the Baby Dragon is provided by veteran voice actor Charlie Adler. I'll go with you. No. Whom you might recognize as Ickis from Ah Real Monsters and Buster Bunny from Tiny Toons, among others. If you're any kind of 90s cartoon buff, you'll probably also be familiar with the voice of Tress McNeil of Dot Warner and Babs Bunny fame, along with almost every single female bit character from Futurama. I'm so proud! Strangely enough, a star as big as Danny DeVito was in the movie, too. Never fear, never doubt. Grundle's up to get you out. You know, I didn't even need to do much research for this segment, because when I was young, I was obsessed with voice actors. In my childhood diary, I wrote not about my day at school, but made lists of all the talent who voiced my favourite cartoon characters on TV. Only one name per episode, though, because I couldn't read the screen or write that fast, and I grew up in an age without easily pausable streaming media services. This has been some insight into the most boring kid in the world. I now return you to your regular viewing. And now the part that you've all been waiting for. Let's dig into the experience of watching the show as an adult. So, taking in the quality of the animation as you watch an episode, 
you'll quickly cotton on to the fact that Hasbro cared more about toy sales than quality programming. Just look at some of these marvels of animation. The animators also can't seem to decide on the body and face shape of Spike the Baby Dragon, even within the same shot. You'll notice that the bad animation of this show scans nothing like the latest My Little Pony series, the animation of which is clean and tight. <laughs> what a waste! You call that an homage? This was the meat of the show! Continuity errors also abound in My Little Pony and Friends. An entire plot about the ponies getting their shadows stolen is very boldly produced, despite the fact that none of the ponies in the episode are actually shown to have shadows until the moment said shadows are stolen. In between episodes, and sometimes even within the same episode, there will be the occasional switcheroo with the voice actors for certain characters too. Ice cream is for eating, not playing in. For example, the show can never really decide how the blue bushwilly is supposed to sound. You're supposed to eat ice cream. Uh-oh, we're sorry. Furthermore, as you progress in the series, you'll see many instances of the voice of the same character leaving the mouths of two different characters or the voices of two different characters talking together, coming from the mouth of the same character. A purple comb, a seashell. I trust it will not be difficult. Oh, I know where to find that. Yeah, that's the worst thing I ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, I'd want to live where it's always warm and beautiful. It's confusing, friends. The colorists don't get a pass either. The colouring of the ponies sometimes changes or even disappears in the same scene, which can lead to a lot of confusion. In a particularly damning example, here Rose Dust, queen of the flutter ponies, breaks up an argument between the belligerent honeysuckle and the demure morning glory, and somehow switches colouring with that of honeysuckle mid-lecture. It's unclear as to whether the colorists or the animators are to blame here, but surely with a little communication and common sense, this whole incident might have been avoided? Then again, this is first and foremost a toy line, and it seems like all the budget for the series went into the opening credits, which are just lovely. Another thing you'll probably notice when you watch My Little Pony and Friends is a slightly awkward-sounding voice acting, despite some of the voice talent. I'm surprised they managed to have an entire episode about the ponies' furniture coming to life and rebelling, because it's a wonder there's any furniture in the show at all from how much the voice actors chew the scenery. Your pardon, mister, but the princess ponies have escaped. What? <laughs> On top of this, every so often it feels like the animators and voice actors were given different scripts, as the animation doesn't really line up with what's going on. For example, I think Bumble the Queen Bee is meant to be asleep and snoring here, and yet... <laughs> and sometimes it feels like the director was out of the room during a recording session and the confused actors just went with what felt right, without any kinds of cues or context. Shrug! Why are you interrupting me when I have important things to do around here? Ah, showing me pictures of goons! On a lesser note, the show appears to have this low-key obsession with faux British accents. Every so often the caricature of a British accent will pop out of a pony or another character and take you by surprise. Hey, ow, that's a good one! Oh, joy! Oh, rapture! Honestly, though, I assume this is not necessarily a feature unique to the show but rather related to the US's strange fixation on British accents as a substitute for charisma. We cannot finish this list of the charming incompetency of My Little Pony and Friends without taking a look at the mostly unnecessary song numbers, which were shoehorned clumsily into each episode, by whom I can only assume was a captive cast of voice actors. Especially in early episodes, songs were distinguishable from the main dialogue by the garish echo separating the voices from the music mix. The melodies are never particularly catchy, besides that ridiculous Sea Ponies song and some other ones that stick in your head purely for being so terrible. I can't help but feel like the lyricists were paid to write all the songs for the series in one day too, as there are so many rushed, very obviously placeholder lyrics which somehow made it into the final cut. Hey, watch out! The ketchup spilled! You see 
either underneath the rug or in the cupboard. Ugh, a bug! Seeing all those shadows makes us want to shout hurrah! Yippee! Hurrah! Sis Boom Ba! Yippee! Hurrah! Sis Boom Ba! <laughs> and I'm not even going to comment on this one. Come back, little hobo, come back! Now, I'm definitely not going to suggest that this is an exhaustive summary of everything that makes this show amazing, but I like to think I've covered enough of it that you would know what you're getting yourself into should you ever decide to travel across the rainbow to Ponyland and leap into this veritable pot of gold. Here is where I'd like to wrap up my essay. But before doing this, I feel I need to say, despite the fact that I went into this specifically to curate the instances of what not to do when creating an animated series, I actually stumbled onto something much darker. There's some underlying lore about the adventures of the Little Ponies which evokes some pretty morbid themes. Elements of genetic hierarchy, the glorification of colonialism, and dubious morality. We're doing this on purpose! We're gonna blow this joint! You get the sense watching the series as an adult that the ponies aren't necessarily the heroes of their tales, even though the framing of each episode insists fervently that they are. I'd like to explore the lore of Ponyland another time. During the meanwhile, though, I hope you all understand now why the latest series of My Little Pony lacks all the charm of the original show. Remember to like and subscribe for more hour-long diatribes about how I'm right and you're wrong. This is Cav P, real My Little Pony fan, signing out. (laughs) 